So all the time all around us in this world in which we live, the message is out there. YOLO, YOLO drives all kinds of marketing. YOLO drives incredible levels of consumer debt unprecedented in the history of the world in the American culture and the Western culture, even in third world countries nowadays, YOLO. You only live once. Teenagers, you're only going to be young once. So the therefore of the world's logic and of Satan's logic is therefore jump on everything you possibly could desire right now in your flesh, grab it, do it, experience it. You only live once, you're only going to be young once, you better go ahead and try it while you can. You better go ahead and buy it while you can. Don't worry about the debt, don't worry about other priorities. This is your value, you only live once. YOLO pretty much drives a whole lot of resolutions in the American population nowadays, including among many who would call themselves Christians. You know, the predominant resolutions have to do with, I'm going to exercise more, which, by the way, y'all all know I'm into that. I, I like exercising, but that's, that's my main resolution for the new year. I'm going to exercise more. I'm going to be healthier in my eating. I'm going to be healthier in my sleep patterns. I'm going to arrange this or that. Now, there's nothing wrong with those things, but they're not the greater or the highest good. And when we start drilling down and realizing that even among people who call themselves Christians, it seems all to be about like managing my so-called health, my physical health, and by the way, making sure I'm going to the right doctor and getting the right drugs because I need pills or I need injections to make sure I feel better. All of this obsession has to do with, at one level, spiritually trying to beat back our aging process, the reality of our aging process. As theologian David Wells talks about in his book, The Courage to be Protestant, there is this whole drive towards, this just might save my soul if I get the right exercise plan, if I get with the right trainer, if I get with the right doctor and take the right medicine, if I go to the right counselor so that he can fix my marriage. It's the path to, as Wells talks about, not quite eternal life. But hey, I'll live longer, and that's what I'm trying to hold on to, right? A few more years here on earth, that's the end game, right? A few more good years here on earth because you only live once. Wells says it's amazing how the American public overwhelmingly still thinks of itself as so-called spiritual. You know, over 90% of Americans say, oh, I'm a spiritual person. And amazingly enough, still around just over 50% identify as Bible-following Christians, believe it or not, in this culture in which we're living. But you know, for them, for their own priorities, for their own resolutions, and honestly, their resolutions for those who have children. I mean, this is really where you can see it. Parents, including parents who would call themselves Christians, raising their own children to idolize and to find their life and their passion in sports. I mean, in sports and in stuff. And in grades, if you get an A instead of a B, you're eternally saved, apparently. You know, that's the big thing that I'm concerned about as a parent. Uh, social media and popularity. A lot of friends and the right friends fitting in with the right crowd, the crowd that's in. The crowd that's in with the parents that I hang out because I want to be in with them. David Wells says this is all an abomination and a wrong path. Well, let's look at the Bible on you only live once. First of all, we'll go to Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. It is appointed for man to die once. You only live once. <laughs> you only die once. And after that comes judgment. That's Hebrews 9, 27. C.T. Studd, the, the great and incredibly self-denying, self-giving missionary, British missionary who served in China, for decades, and then in India, and then in Africa. He died in the uh, Central Republic of Congo in the 1930s. 
after serving in the 1800s and 1900s. He wrote this, only one life will soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. I was having a conversation with Dean towards the end of this past week. Dean asked me, like, what, what do you see as far as ministry emphases this year for 2024? And we talked about some ministry things, but I said, big picture, what we're looking at is we are, and this has always been an issue, but I really see it in the 21st century now, an age in which people and young people, because Dean's ministry intersects with youth and then young families and family ministry, nested families, uh, the issues of my identity, the cause, the cause I'm gonna rally around and kind of be connected with, which then leads into my community. And I see this now in the 21st century, there's all kinds of, this is why something like Black Lives Matter was a big identity thing, a cause thing and a community thing, all kinds of things all over the place. The LGBTQ community cause identity, I identify myself, the political stuff and lots of people are just as addicted to politics as some people are to their sexual expression. You know, I'm, I'm a member of this party, but not just this party, the good group in this party. That's my group. I'm the one who really followed this guy or this girl. Uh, you know, so, and, and by the way, if you're not in my particular subset, you're obviously not part of my identity, and my identity tells me what truth is, whether that's sexual or political or whatever. That's how I, what is my truth is my truth, and my identity is totally connected with my truth. That's the postmodern 21st century we live in. Y'all get this, right? And then it leads into, hey, I social media connect with and like the causes that frame and connect with my identity, and that leads to community. Well, so there's all kinds of people who are very religious about signaling their virtue for their righteousness of whatever 21st century cause they're into that has nothing to do with Christianity. The interesting thing is I see this mirrored with some Christians, like they're doing the same kind of stuff, only the kind of Christianized, baptized version of the same stuff. But the Bible is taking us in a different direction with my identity and my truth is not in myself. It's in someone else, someone named Jesus. And, and he has a truth that's different. And he calls me into a community, not just to show up at church for an hour or so. I mean, to actually be in the body that he's called me into and to be into the cause, his great commission. I mean, we have this incredible opportunity with our youth and with our young people, and I don't care if you're in your 80s or 90s, to invite you in to know a different kind of identity in Christ and a cause that is his gospel, his mission, and a community that is truly not just, well, I vote this way and therefore I'm with this group of Christians. No, no actually to be in the body of Jesus that is sold out for him in the Great Commission. You know, I was interested to and excited to see, I don't know who's doing the slides, but we need to move on, whoever's up there. Uh, we're well beyond YOLO, by the way. Uh, yeah, okay, good. Okay, so I was interested to be connecting with Nathan Cole, uh, with uh, him, and he and uh, Maddie Mason, and I think some of our other young people have been at the International Cross Conference this past week in um, Louisville, Kentucky. You know, that's all about being committed to the cause of Christ and ministry and mission, giving your life. And, and this picture that, this is one of the pictures Nathan sent me, but this one, you'll notice, the guy who's kind of leaning over, the older looking guy who's leaning over at his chair up on the stage, that man is named John Piper. If you kind of know about evangelical Christianity, if you keep up with, you probably know him, he's published probably, I'm not exaggerating, 100 books. Uh, all kinds of sermons all over the place, all kinds of speaking engagements. And so he was there, John Piper was there at the Cross Conference. And I remember one of his seminal books from 20 years ago. I hope if you're a parent, you've already had your teenager read it. If, you, if you're a college student, I hope you read it. If you're a young, young adult whether, or middle age, I don't care. Don't waste your life. Don't waste your life. Piper says, you only get one pass at life. That's all, only one. You only live once. 
And the lasting measure of that life is Jesus Christ. Or as one of Jesus' followers, a man named Paul, who was an apostle and a doulos, a bondservant or slave of Christ, said, we'll say this when we install our officers, whatever you do, whether in word or deed, whatever you do, do it all, every single thing, in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Or as Paul, a follower of Jesus, a bond slave to Jesus, said also, we open the worship with this. I, I personally, have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live. It's not about my identity. It's not about my sexuality. It's not about my political preferences. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. YOLO by Jesus. Today, let's turn to Luke chapter 9, verses 23 through 26. This is right in the middle, kind of heart and central, to a larger passage we started circling around last week, or larger segment of passages in Luke chapter 9. We'll come back to the larger segment next week. But today, Luke 9, 23 through 26, and I've added in uh, John chapter 14, verse 6, because it pairs with our passage for today. And he, this is Jesus, said to all, if anyone wants to come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. For what does it profit a person to acquire, to gain the whole world, yet himself destroy or forfeit. For whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the Son of Man be ashamed when he comes in his glory and that of the Father and of the holy angels. And then John 14, verse 6, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Friends, the grass withers. The flowers fade, but the word of our God will stand forever. Amen. You only live once. YOLO, not by the world, but by Jesus. Whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will save it. So we come to this paradox that we see in verses 24 through 26. We're going to go to them first, and we'll come back to verse 23. Perishing versus paradise. The good life now, you can have your best life now, uh, versus glory everlasting. So the paradox begins in chapter 9, verse 24, the first part of verse 24. And we're going to dig into these verses. I'm going to make you do a little bit of work because I want you to see some connections here. Whoever wants to, the ESV translates this whoever would, but I've gone ahead and emphasized it for you, wants to, desires to, wills to. Because the word there in the actual manuscript is thele which is a word for will, whoever desires to, wants to, wills to. Whoever's agenda is to save his life. Now again, fellow means to will, to desire, to want. And let me pause right here and ask you this. I'm gonna keep working through this verse, but let me ask you this. What is your will? In 2024, what do you want? What do you want? What's, what's your agenda? Let me ask you a deeper question. Do you want God's will? Now, everybody in here, surely, hopefully, is going to say, oh, yeah, I want God's will. But I want you to really reflect on that. Do you want God's will? You know, every Sunday, and I hope every day, parents, I hope with your children, every morning or night, you're praying with them. And you're praying, including this, our Father in heaven, your 
will be done. Not my fellow, yours, be done. I invite you into that way, the way of wanting God's will, not my agenda. So back to this. So for whoever wants to, wills to, to save, so sai, okay? So sai, his life will lose it. Now the word here, the verb here, the root, is sozo. That means to save, to heal, to preserve. Now you see we're getting to the resolutions, right? How am I going to preserve my life? How am I going to preserve myself? Resolutions really reflect that. So let me ask you another application question. This is deep spiritual. You can reflect on this. Do I look to myself and my identity as my savior and my protector? Or do I look to the crucified Christ? Jesus says whoever wills to save himself, it's not going to go well. I want to invite you, youth, I want to invite you, look to Jesus as your savior. You're not your savior. Okay, this is a big difference. For whoever wants to save his, now I got to make you work here for a moment, I'm telling you, it's, it's key. Whoever wants to save his life, tain sukain out to. Okay, the central word there is the word in Greek for soul, psuche. It's the word that means soul, self, and life. Okay, it means all of those things. It's the parallel to, in the Hebrew, the Old Testament, nefesh means soul, self, life. Now, let me tell you why this is important. God has given you a soul, a self, and at the judgment, you're going to be accountable for your soul, yourself. The Bible says this over and over again. Jesus is talking as the judge right now, the one who will judge the living and the dead. And he's saying, don't lose your self, your soul that God has given you. If you trade it for a pot of porridge in this world, in this brief life, you're in trouble going into eternity. Okay. Be very careful about and understand how in parents you have souls under your household that your primary calling in life is to help shepherd those souls, those selves in relationship to God. Hey, it's number one. Whoever wants to save his soul, his life, his self will lose it. You're trying to save yourself. You're trying to protect, preserve yourself. You're going to lose it. This reminds us of Jesus' parable of the rich fool. We'll get to this in, I don't know, a couple of months. Uh, Luke 12. At the closing there, the key thing, when Jesus is talking about the rich fool who's had a really good year, and he's looking to a great new year, speaking of 2024 and New Year's resolutions, man, he's made it big in the market. He's got a great harvest. He's saying, I'm going to build more barns for all my stuff. i got great plans. Jesus says talking about the fool, and I will say to my soul, do you catch that? I will say to my soul, myself, soul? Jesus is really emphasizing the soul thing. Suke? Suke mu? You have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. Now catch the, the punchline here. Jesus says, but God said to him, fool, this night, your soul, yourself, your life, Suke su is required of you. So this brings us to the par paradox continuing back in our main passage in Luke chapter 9, verse 24, second part. But here's the flip side. Here's the other side of the coin. Whoever loses his life, whoever gives up his life, if you give up yourself, if you give up your identity, if you give up your soul over to Jesus, he gives it to you forever. I mean, this is the gospel paradox. Whoever loses his life, his soul, his self, for my sake, will save it. Christians who actually follow Jesus make different resolutions than most people do. 
my values, my priorities as a Christian are different than those of most people, most parents. Most parents you hang around with. I'm just telling you parents, you gotta decide which parents you're gonna hang out with. Which ones are you gonna cave to or agree with, be in community with? Most acquaintances. Jonathan Edwards, when he was, it's either 23 or 24, I forget which, his early young adult resolutions. I mean, the guy's awesome, you know, he's already got degrees from Yale and everything and he's off preaching, but here's his resolution in his early 20s. Number 17, I shall live so as I shall wish I had done when I come to die. In other words, when I die, I'm gonna be proud of everything I did. What I did with, for, in our case, with 2024. I'm gonna be happy about it when I die. It's gonna have been worthwhile. Now, with Jesus and the teaching, the paradox is completed in verse 25. For what does it profit a person to acquire, to gain the whole world, yet do what? Destroy or profit, or destroy or forfeit what? What's gonna be forfeited? What's gonna be destroyed? For what does it profit a person to gain, to acquire the whole world, yet himself, his very self, destroy or forfeit? Now, most of you, I'm pretty much sure almost all of you know the most famous, one of the most famous verses in the New Testament. What would that be? John 3.16. You know what it says, right? For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not do what? Perish, but have eternal life. Hold that thought on perish. Now look at this. What does it profit you, Jesus says, to gain the whole world but destroy or forfeit your very self? It's the same word source. Apollosus here with Jesus, destroy yourself. Notice this. What does it mean? I, th I thought John 3.16 was just something I could recite as kind of like a pledge of allegiance and raise my hand and be saved. No, no, no. Jesus tells you this is a whole life before him. And if you actually believe in Jesus, you're not going to sell out to the world. You're going to go with Jesus. Teenagers, are you catching this? John 3.16 is not a slogan that I can clap for for 30 seconds and be emotional about at a rally for 10 seconds and be saved. No, no. Salvation is a way of life. So Jesus says, you want to be on the right side of John 3.16? Don't try to save your soul. Don't try to save yourself. Don't try to hang on to stuff. Give it up for me. And that means you believe in me. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish. Apollomi, same, same, same verb here, but have eternal life. Now back to Jesus' clear application. Whoever, this is verse 26, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? What does it mean to go with Jesus? Jesus says this, whoever is ashamed of me and my words, of him will the son of man be ashamed when he comes in the glory of in his own glory and that of his father and of the holy angels. So what does it mean to lose my soul, to perish? It means, and Dean, by the way, told me I should really emphasize this with teenagers and young people. It means being ashamed of Jesus and his words in order to acquire, gain popularity, acceptance, to fit in with the right groups, not to ruffle any feathers, Guys, are you catching this? This is what it means to believe in Jesus, is to be willing to ruffle feathers and not be accepted in all the groups you want to be accepted in. Okay? Uh, being ashamed of Jesus, tamping down on mentioning that I'm a Christian in order to get the job or to fit in with the cool people or the boss at the job or at the university. Yeah, we, we don't talk about stuff at the university. Uh, even at lunch break, we don't talk about anything. I, I, you know, they think I'm kind of a Neanderthal or something if I'm actually bringing up anything from the Bible. Jesus says, I'm, I'm telling you this. If you're ashamed of me and my words at the university, in your own home, the way you manage yourself, the way you prioritize sports over the Savior, Jesus is saying, I'm telling you, I'm going to be ashamed of you at the judgment. 
because you're not in on John 3.16 the way I intended it. That's what's going on here. Good relate. I'm just trying to fit in with my kids. I still want to be their friend, even though they're chasing after this identity stuff that is anti-Christian. But I, want to, I just want to support them. But yeah, you should love them, but you should you support the road to hell? Probably not with your children. Which brings us back to this reality. Salvation and being with Jesus eternally is not on my terms. Jesus, I'll give you A and B, but I'm not giving you C and D. It doesn't work like that. It's on his terms, and he wants all in. It's all or nothing with Jesus. Salvation and being with him now and eternally is all in or all out. Jesus makes this clear in verse 23. We're coming back to this. And in John chapter 14, verse 6. And let me be clear on this. Jesus has the authority to say this. You can refer back to my morning and evening sermons on Christmas Eve. Jesus, Bethlehem born everlasting king. He's the king. And this baby changes everything. And then definitely on John 14, verse 6, my sermon over at the Christ Church in Jerusalem on May 7th of last year. The way, the truth, and the life. This is not on my terms, but on Christ's terms. There are three terms, commands that he gives us here. And he said to all, if anyone, notice this, this is everybody. This, is every, this applies to everybody. He says to all, if anyone would come after me, let him, number one, deny himself. Number two, take up his cross daily. Deny yourself. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, the German Protestant pastor and theologian who came over to the United States and found a bunch of churches, even in the 1930s, talking about cheap grace, was driven to write the cost of discipleship. Saw a little bit of faith in some churches in Harlem. I mean, real, like, Christ-following faith. And then went back to Germany, felt compelled to go back to Germany, died as a martyr opposing Hitler and his regime, was hanged in a concentration camp, Bonhoeffer was, where he preached to and evangelized the prison guards all the way up to his death while he's being walked to be hanged in May of 1945. He's evangelizing his executioners. Bonhoeffer, in the cost of discipleship, says, when Christ calls a man, he bids him to come and die. The first Christ suffering that every Christian must experience is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. Or as Paul, the bond slave of Christ, says, you are not your own because you were bought with a price, so glorify God with your body. Take up your cross daily. Now, let's talk about this for a moment. This is not symbolic or pretty metaphorical language for Jesus and his disciples. This is why they're so shocked when he says this. Because they know, they immediately visualize what Jesus is talking about. The cross is not a necklace that you wear around your neck. The cross is not a statue that you build. It's not some symbolic thing. For Jesus and his disciples in the first century, they know exactly what this means. Take up your cross daily. As Howard Marshall in his New International Greek Testament commentary says at page 373, I'll give you this so you don't have to work your way all the way through the book, it's a public spectacle. And they know this. Jesus knows this. The condemned man was publicly paraded to his execution carrying his own patibulum, his own crossbar, knowing that his life in this world was over that day. And Jesus says, you as a Christian should live like that every day. Your life is over. You're willing to die and going to die for Jesus. You're giving it all in for Jesus, and you're doing it publicly, being harassed and humiliated on the way to your death. That's what is before Jesus. Notice the visual here. This is the patibulum. It, it envisions Jesus, by the way, carrying his own cross. Can you see the crown of thorns there? When Jesus says this, this is shocking. This is an all-in or all-out call. And Bonhoeffer says the cross is laid on every Christian. Or as Paul says, I, I personally, have been crucified with Christ. Jesus' terms, the way, the truth, and the life, three commands, three words. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. It's not about you, it's about him. Take up his cross daily and follow me. And I have good news. 
Jesus has already made the way of the cross. He's the pioneer of our faith and our salvation. He's gone before us in this. But he's calling you to come to follow his path. And Jesus' call, as Don Carson says, is not an invitation to spiritual masochism, but to life and bounty. This is the real way, surprisingly, to an abundant life, to give it all in for Christ. For it is an infallible rule of the kingdom that self-focus issues in death, while whoever loses his life, for me and my words, will save it. Now, for only a few will this commitment entail actual, right now, martyrdom, loss of physical life. But for all of us, Carson writes, it means death to self, discipleship to Jesus, including glad, happy confession, refusal to be ashamed of Jesus and his words in this adulterous and sinful generation. Bottom line, here's the bottom line. You want the bottom line? With one more word focus here. What does it profit a person to acquire, to gain? Kerdaino, okay? The whole world. That's the language Jesus uses. Now catch what Paul uses. This is the noun form in Philippians 1.21. For me to live is Christ, and to die is what? I thought I'd lose everything when I die. I just want to hang on to this life, this physical life. And no, no, no. For me to die is gain. You've got to decide where your investment is. Gain in the stuff of this world or in giving it all, giving your life to Jesus. For me, I will love and I hope and pray and trust that our officers we're about to install will follow Jesus who first loved me, who loves me right now, and will, it's guaranteed, will love me all the way into eternity, will take me home with his Father. I'll give the best of my 2024, all my heart, all my soul, all my means, my private life, my public life, my time, my effort, my dollars, my relationships, my, my parent relationships, my spouse relationships, to Christ and to his economy. C.T. Studd, again, only one life, the still small voice gently pleads for a better choice, bidding me selfish aims to leave and to God's holy will to cleave. Only one life, twill soon be passed. Only what's done for Christ will last. And when I am dying, happy I'll be if the lamp of my life has burned for thee. Or as Paul says, whatever you do, whether in word or in deed, do it all, every single thing you do and say this year, giving thanks to the Father God, through the name of the Lord Jesus. God is good. You only live once. Go with Jesus. Go with him. He's inviting you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.